Welcome to the Pursuit of Learning podcast. I'm your host, Clint Murphy. My goal is for each of us to grow personally, professionally, and financially one conversation at a time. To do that, we will have conversations with subject matter experts across a variety of modalities. My job as your host will be to dig out those golden nuggets of wisdom that will facilitate our growth. Join me on this pursuit. Today on The Pursuit of Learning, I have Tracy Lamry, a high-profile international award-winning publicist. She is the founder and managing director of Lamry Media and the author of the upcoming book, Get Repped. Tracy is a well-known, long-time advocate on a number of important worldwide issues and is passionate about amplifying important messages and being a voice for those who most need one. She is recognized by media around the world for her 20-year campaign that ultimately helped free an innocent man from death row. We talk about Jimmy Dennis and the fight to free him from death row the journey to her realization that she should be a publicist, how you should be yourself, believe in yourself, and not be afraid. Tracy's story inspired me, and I hope it inspires you. Tracy, welcome to The Pursuit of Learning. It's great to have you join me today. I want to start off with a question that I ask people to get us on a bit of a clean state as we begin. Can you tell me some things that are exciting you and about life right now? Yeah, I'm finding all kinds of, you know, that there's still all kinds of opportunity in spite of COVID, in spite of being in my basement office and not getting to travel and all that fun stuff right now for work or meet people, you know, that we're still finding ways to connect and I'm meeting pretty amazing people all over the world and, you know, finding just cool opportunities, not just on a business point of view, but just that there's still a lot out there. And I'm telling people, as long as you have this connection, this thing in front of you, we still have the world in front of us. So not letting things shut us down, <laughs> I guess. That is a fantastic point of view. Can you share with the listeners some examples of ways that you're using the computer, the internet to reach out, to connect, to be in touch with other people? During COVID. Yeah, one way has been, and I'm a publicist, so, you know, I've been looking at podcasts in the past, you know, putting my clients on there as kind of media opportunities. But during COVID, particularly during a Christmas, you know, when everybody was doing something else and I was looking for things to do, I ended up uh, reaching out to start. Like I've never really booked myself on them in terms of speaking to an entrepreneur audience. And I started speaking to entrepreneur audiences literally around the world. I have, it's crazy. I've been booked on, I've either done or I've been booked on from last October to next April, to this coming April, a hundred, some 180 podcasts around the world. Oh man, India, like literally everywhere, you know, Dubai, England. So, and and I was just thinking, why not as media opportunities? But the more I do, the more I see there's such a, you know, what I do is such a mystery to so many people. You know, how do you get yourself in the media? How do you get your message in the media? How do you do all that? So, you know, whether it's a business audience or an activist audience or, a, you know, whoever, it's a it's a message really for anybody that has that kind of interest, right? So I've been lucky in that way. But it's I find it's just amazing to connect with people. I'm just literally meeting people. I wasn't thinking of it as marketing. I don't do any advertising or marketing. People just come to me. But all of a sudden, I've just made like amazing connections with people that are also doing really cool things. And then they start saying, oh, I could use media for that. So all of a sudden that's opened up, you know, more business opportunities too. But also just with the connecting, it really is a new networking because there's been a few people that have hired me, but more so there's people now that I just have all kinds of new friends, honestly, new connections, new that do different neat things that I may send work their way. They may send my work there, you know, or we just, we just connected on Facebook and now we're friendly, you know? So literally the world can be open instead of being closed and, there can be positivity in, in it instead of just watching all the craziness, you know, stateside or something and worrying all the time. We can actually take actual steps to make sure that things are still, the wheels keep on turning and things keep on still being good and we still have good news. 
That is something very encouraging for the listeners to hear. One of the things that I've found during COVID, Tracy, is is I've realized that people that I may have read their books in the past and found them to be amazing individuals and thought, wow, it would be great to work with that person. Well, now, today, on Zoom, we can just reach out, whether it's Zoom, whether it's Teams, whatever Absolutely. platform you're on. Yeah. You reach out and you can have a coach from anywhere in the world. It's pretty and that's incredible. So, it's funny that you said it too. I was say, thinking the same. I was saying the same thing because I work with celebrities as well as entrepreneurs. You know, some I I understand. Which I'm telling everybody now that like what you just said, exactly right. Everybody, everybody, whether you're a celebrity, a big name, or whoever, we're all doing the same thing right now, which is sitting here in front of this screen trying to figure out. Like, how are we going to navigate this new world? Literally, everybody's thinking that. You know, every TV show is different now. They're having to do. So, yeah, you're right. Everybody's accessible. Reach out. If you're credible, you know, which just means you have a potential idea and you're, you know, reasonable, then you can reach out. The world, honestly, we all have the same tools at our fingertips. So The world has become our oyster. All right, let's flip back in time. So, Tracy, when you were... Just out of high school, you were 21, you backpacked through Europe for four months. I did. What were some of your fond memories of doing that at a young age? That is something nobody's ever asked me on a podcast before. <laughs> that's some deep research. <laughs> what are some of my memories? I think that's the best thing ever. That was one of the, I one time I would have said that was the best thing I've ever did. Cause, and I think really still it was a big thing. Because one thing I remember thinking when I was young and I had worked, you know, for like a year to make up, to save up that money. I was still living at home, so I was able to do that, you know. And I remember thinking, sitting in Europe, wherever I was, thinking, oh, wow, at 21, huh, I actually did it. You know, people say they're going to do this for their whole life. And I just said I was going to do it, and I did it. And I remember thinking, that's really cool. Look, you can do things, you know, just do it. Don't think about it and plan it and never do it. Talk yourself out of it. Just do it. And so I remember that as a thing being really neat. And then I also remember just thinking, wow, I have to learn more languages and stuff because there's all, I can't communicate with people. It's just so weird. I, cause I'm a communicator. And all of a sudden I can't, I'm in all these Capra in Czechoslovakia and Germany and, and I don't, I can't speak those languages. So I learned, I was, I became interested, which I haven't really followed up on. I did for a little while, but the life got the better of me, but I thought it would be really interesting to learn languages just to be able to communicate better and, you know, that's one thing I never really did. The another memory from when you were younger probably would have been similar time frame that really struck me when I was doing some reading because it reminded me of the night that I fell in love with my wife was I read in an article that when you remembered meeting Dave for the first time, you said he came over and we literally talked all night. We talked about politics and racism and sexism and activism. At the end of the conversation, I marveled that I'd talked for hours it's to true. him and hadn't had to explain where he was wrong with any of it. What was that <laughs> night? What was that night like? Yeah, no, that was literally like, oh wow, like, oh my God. That was actually okay. I might really like this guy. That's gonna be a problem. I don't want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> that's really, because yeah honestly I, I remember i was literally struck by that that wasn't a joke when i said that i was literally like huh i literally just had a seven hour conversation with that guy and I, I didn't have to roll my eyes once or explain why this was wrong or think okay really got you know and that was just really like novelty i guess at that time so later i met other people where that wasn't always the case but i mean i don't know i guess who i was hanging out with at 21 you know i was always the one trying to explain this stuff but yeah so that was super important and that's totally absolutely you know what got my attention and kept my attention and that's been our whole you know trajectory is like not just the pretty hair he's got really nice hair he's a good looking guy but like I, that's not what convinced me and he couldn't have convinced me you know like it literally was all that that passionate you know advocacy stuff and that's really what kept us you know, I shouldn't say kept us together, but I mean, like, oh, it's been a big major part of our, our, our everything we've done. Like, now we've built this business together, which is an outgrowth of its communication, which is what we were doing before for advocacy work, right? So, that's right. We've always done everything together from building the, you know, the Canadian Coalition Against the Death Penalty to the work for Jimmy Dennis to, you know, we got the first call center in Canada, Union Night, which I don't even think is written anywhere except for an old Globe and Mail article from 25 years ago. But, you know, so we were always doing stuff. We always were like, if something bothered us, we'd figure out ways to like, well, let's, you know, clearly we should do something about it. And he was always like that. And I was always like that. And, and 
you hit on a bunch of areas that we are definitely going to dive deeper on. But staying on that conversation, because I think it may be great for listeners who are in the dating scene and, you know, maybe they're they're being a little more fake. They're not necessarily approaching it. It sounds like what you two had that first night, and I still remember the very first night I had a conversation like this with my wife. It was an openness, a real conversation, if you will. How are you able to have such an open, real conversation? on just meeting each other. Yeah, you know what was interesting is I was introduced to Dave by a friend who had been my, who had my best friend in teenage years, you know, and then she ended up leaving the high school I went to and going to another high school and in, ended up going to the same school as Dave. And that was years before. I, didn't, I hadn't met him in those days. And then she and I actually backpacked through Europe together with my friend Jennifer that I backpacked through Europe with, surprisingly. And it was about a year and a half after we come back from Europe. We weren't really hanging out that much at that point. I don't think it was because we backpacked to Europe together. But, <laughs> but you know, life had gotten, we were doing different things. We hadn't really seen each other much. And so it was probably the first time in a year and a half after that, that we were going to get together to see each other. And that's when we were out and we had ended up running into Dave and started talking. So basically, it was a really close friend introduced me to Dave. And he was from a different group of her friends. So that group of friends was always like, you know, they're basically, they were a close group of friends in high school. They weren't so much anymore, but there were connections with a friend. So I feel like we were introduced as friends and we felt like there was a friend community that like, you know, I wasn't just a girl that he was trying to pick up. You know, there was like a more to it. There was like, if he had been like just a player and an idiot, he wouldn't, it wouldn't have been weird. It would have been weird in that community. Right. So we were actually, I remember not thinking, I mean, he was like, now that I look back on it, he was trying to pick me up from the beginning, <laughs> but like, <laughs> but I was just like, I was in a, just, you know, I don't know, partly maybe lack of self-confidence too. Cause I was a fat girl and he's this gorgeous guy. And I was relating to him on activist level where I have no issues. I'm never going to be ever feeling like I'm less than or whatever, you know? But like, I, I may not have expected it to be a, a, that kind of a connection too. So I was just like, whatever, you know, I'd be, and, and when it did come, you know, happen to be more like a dating connection, I was no way to that. Like, really, I was like rebelling against that a lot for like a whole month. And he had to keep on trying. He's like, no, nah, I don't even know why I did. Cause normally I wouldn't even be like, come on, I really feel like we should. But he really felt like, no, no, this is like really right. And I was just like, no, we're just going to be friends. We're just going to be friends. But that was where the the lack of you know confidence in that came in. Everything else I'm fully confident about. But I am expecting if we start dating this good looking guy, you know, in about a month that all my friends like, you know, in about a month in a month it's gonna be over, whatever. I'll tell him to throw just whatever. And then I'm just gonna be bummed out. And most importantly, I won't wanna work with him anymore. And I've actually met this person who's really cool, who really gets it, who's doing this radio show and all this. And that's more important. I actually am more motivated to keep on knowing this person than to get into some stupid relationship that's going to be over in a month and it's just going to be dumb. That's what I was thinking. you know. So what struck you, and it sounds like it actually struck him, but maybe you didn't necessarily realize he was feeling this yeah, way. Totally. It was just that- It was from the that, beginning. It, I was just it, like, whatever. It, yeah. And it, it was that intellectual connection. 100% everything. Like, I mean, you know, with me, with yeah, like it was just like, you know, there's no denying on either side, really. But I was just like, no, uh, uh, mm, mm, no, you know, not going to do it. <laughs> it's ridiculous. But now I think how I could have just literally, I'm really grateful I finally stopped doing that, you know, because there was no reason for me to be like, no, no, other than my own lack of confidence and where that might go. Right. And I could have just no, no, no myself right out of the last 26 years, we've been, we've been married for 26 years. We have two children. We built that nonprofit together. We helped a guy get off death row together. We're now building a, an international business together. You know, I could have just been like, oh no, I'm afraid that maybe, you know, <laughs> forget. <laughs> and it was that close because I was pretty stubborn. <laughs> and do, do you still have that level of conversation today that you had then? Oh yeah. Yeah. Excellent. The So you've said in a number of interviews, and you're already mentioning it today, that you had a number of projects and partnerships that you worked alongside each other in. Can you share with us what some of those earlier ones were that the two of you worked on together uh, prior to now. the Jimmy Dennis? Oh, before Jimmy, yeah. Uh, yeah, so, there was so much when I look back on it, I'm like, man, we've done a lot together. Because... <laughs> 
Early on, he had a radio show. He was on CAUT 89.5 FM Toronto, which is University of Toronto Radio. But it's like real radio. It goes to four or five cities. It's, you know, huge. And um, so he brought me on to that radio show. It was an activist show. It was, you know, an advocacy show. We talked about the same kind of, you know, racism and stuff you know, all those things, you know, and poverty issues and inequality and just all kinds of stuff that, like that. And that was the first thing. Um, and then a couple of years later, we were, or I guess I should probably that year, later that year, we were both working. So we're like 24 then, 23, 24. And we're both working in telesales, early entry level sales. And um, one of them was at a call center for like a market research place called Canadian Facts. And just like any other market research center or, or you know, call center, no better or worse than a million others. But like, for whatever reason, we started, we, you know, it was unfair and they were asked, people were like, oh, we should do something. So we're like, okay, we could do this. So we literally approached a union. It wasn't the other way around. A union had not, ad- I mean, there was no unions in North America, I don't think at that time, that had unionized any call centers. And we approached steel workers because we heard that it didn't matter what the actual thing was, they could still go in. And we got them to come in and, you know, do it was literally, it was really our campaign before we were ever publicists, but looking back on it, we did an incredible campaign. We did a, a really a stealth campaign. In fact, we made sure that everybody had information. We made sure. And to the point where it was, <laughs> I'll never forget the day they got it. It was the the vote for the union. We should never have been able even to get 50% because there was half of the people in the call center and the other half of the employees we didn't even know and worked in malls and we'd never be able to find, et cetera. But it turned out that somebody on the inside had got us some information so we were able to contact those people. So anyway, we were able to give them all the information about why we were doing it, blah, blah, blah. And long story short, I'll never forget the day of the vote. <laughs> I haven't been involved with any union since then or whatever, but I'll never forget the day of the vote. The union guys were there. And, you know, the, the management, <laughs> management was there and they were literally reading the, they had, they had never, the union people had, ne- and they were, had been in the union for 50 years. They had never seen a vote like this. 98% yes to the union. 98% yes. The management, they looked like they were literally, their faces had gone white. Like they were so shocked because not, they thought, like they literally walked into thinking there's no way these people could even get 50%. Like it was literally physically impossible because they thought we didn't even know about the other employees. They thought they were pulling a fast one. That meanwhile, we knew it all. We'd gone. We'd approached everybody. We were call center people. We knew how to phone people. We phoned them <laughs> and told them why we were doing it, right? And, you know, answered all the questions. So, yeah, 99%. They had never seen a vote like that. The man, the union people were like, whoa. And then the management the next day, and it's funny because the same person who had said to me, and this is when I'm 26 years old, right? The same person who had said to me, two weeks before i've been hearing union since i started at this place and i said to her well you never heard it from me and then the conversation was over and then two weeks later we had this now we had the vote so i was like she was like i union all day people always say that and i was like yeah but this time i said it you know what <laughs> and sure enough 99 percent. then that same person called me into the office literally in tears two days after that saying they're not listening to me and i was like almost like counseling her going, oh, calm down. They're just excited right now. You're still the boss. Don't worry. You're still the boss. And I had to like literally like talk her down because management was freaking out that. So I'll never forget about that. We got such a high union vote, 99%. And that was the management that had just been saying, sure, ha, 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 never going to happen. Two days later, I'm in the office and she's like, (laughs) I was like, you should have, you know, maybe not discounted the employees. We wouldn't be where we are, you know. You wouldn't be the first and only call center in Canada to be unionized. <laughs> like, And have more call centers been unionized since that one? I, I think I've heard, I mean, I'm not really in the loop on that because I wasn't a union activist or anything. It wasn't, okay. but I, I do believe, and that, that made front page news in the Globe, or front page business news, like the business section of the Globe and Mail. One of my first media when I was 25, 26 years old. And the Globe and Mail is like our major conservative newspaper of record, like conservative meaning the business press and that you know and it made the front page of the business press like we're 25 years old with our pictures in color saying you know just unionize the first and then you'd think that would have impeded my job prospects later because i remember literally when that was on the cover this was another funny story in my life when that was literally on the cover of the section you know the business section i had left that job it is funny because people must think oh now we unionize it now we're walking away it was something completely different i had, had another opportunity to go and get a job i was still at that job But I had another opportunity to get a job, which started my track of working from home. I ended up getting it because I applied for a job with a publishing company looking for people to do just telesales from home. 
And I thought, well, that's okay. neat. And that's in the late 90s. I thought, oh, wow, that'd be awesome. I ended up getting it. But when I went to apply for that job, this is how close I thought I almost didn't get that. He's got, he's literally, it's the week, it's the week that the Globe and Mail has my picture in color in the front about how I, I just unionized a call center. So you would think as a potential employer, you see that girl walk in and apply for a job at your call center. First thing you're going to do is go, what? Bye. Keep on walking, right? So I literally go for my second interview and I really want this job because it's a work from home job, even though it's just a call center, you know, just call. I really want it because I can do from home. And I'm literally at the second interview. It's all going well. And he has it on his desk. And I'm like, oh man, he literally, you know, like, I don't even remember. He said something about it and I responded and I, you know, but I was literally like, I'm not here to like cross jump over. And he ended up hiring me, thankfully, because that ended up keeping me on track to work from home for five years, which is what I was doing when I finally figured out years later that, hey, I'm actually, I've got the skills of a publicist from all this death penalty stuff. And I just transitioned it literally, you know, boom. But yeah, so that's a funny story. (laughs) Excellent. So let's dive into that death penalty story. From what I have read, and you just highlighted it now, it was your work with Jimmy Dennis and the skills you picked up in fighting for his freedom that ultimately led you to realize, wait a second, I can be a publicist. So let's dive into that work with Jimmy before we dive into the publicist role. And there was years between it. It wasn't like I just, it was like, we, I was doing that with Jimmy from 1998. And he was ultimately released in 2017, but this was 2012 or so by the time, yeah, when I finally, when I said, actually, you know, wait a minute, I'm a publicist. So like, yeah, there was a long time, like 14 years. So it's not like it wasn't a, it was like, wait a minute. Oh man. (laughs) So let's go back to 1998. One of the things that really struck me in one of the articles I read, you and Dave set up a Netscape account to advocate for his innocence in 1998. Can you walk me through that? At that time, correct me if I'm wrong, it was right after I graduated high school, getting web pages set up, that was still relatively Brand new. new. That wasn't what a lot of people, you know, it wasn't WordPress where you just plug and play. You two were doing some serious work to get that set up. Can you talk us through that and what that experience was like? Yeah. <laughs> So that all started because so we had had our radio show and it was a couple of years, our radio show, we stopped doing it like maybe a year and a half before that because they had switched to like a midnight show and it was going to be more music, less advocacy. And we just weren't as interested in that and our ended up just, we ended up walking away from it essentially. And um, so then it was the early days of the internet. Like you said, 95, everyone's got, you know, the internet's up, but really not people aren't making regular pages. Certainly we don't have Twitter. We don't have Facebook all that stuff. So advocacy, which was way different than which someone just pointed that out to me recently. I forgot that. They said, you know, when you did all this, you didn't have Facebook and Twitter. You didn't, you couldn't just tweet at reporters. You had like info at whatever reporter news state, you know what I mean? It was a lot. You do email. And that was it. So we found out about the case of Jimmy Dennis. He literally paid a hundred bucks or something. Somebody paid for him to be on some site where he thought, gee, there's, they're making, you know, prisoners can get a word out there. Somebody, he paid somebody, anyway, whatever it was, he had a little ad there saying, I'm not looking for a girlfriend. I'm not looking for a pen pal. I'm innocent. I really just need help. My husband and I saw that. And for some reason, you know, we were asked the other day, why would you, why did we actually reach out and write him? And that was a part of it was, you know, you're in your twenties and we're activists and all that. But even so, that wouldn't be enough to write a letter to death row. But I think the answer to that is because we had also recently had the radio show. So we were still in that information gathering, like feeling like reporters, you know, so what's going on here kind of thing, right? So that combined with that advocacy, you know, so we're like, well, wait. And I remember we were like, gee, how innocent can this guy be? Let's see. And we, and for some reason, we wrote a letter, mailed it off and sent it to death row. And he wrote back for some reason, 18 pages, double space, each side with all the information he had in his cell at the time. And like, we were so innocent. We were like, oh my God. What do we do? We, we, you know, we asked for this information now, and now we don't like, what are we going to do? Just, oh, thanks. Bye. We can't help you, you know. And how do we help? So, my husband decided to learn how to make a web page, and it wasn't, he didn't have to learn HTML and Netscape. You could, it was some like, you know, like there was some, I didn't do it. He did the websites, but he figured it out how to make websites. And then I figured out how to, like, well, now what do we do? How do we get people to know about this? Great. It's a website me and my friend is looking at, but like, how do we? So I learned how to write a press release. I literally went, literally went to Alta Vista in 1998. And I remember it so clearly, which is the precursor of Google and all that, right? All, you know, 
how to write a press release, press release template. Clearly, okay, I looked at a few of them, all right, for a media release, four or five paragraphs, quote at the end, contact, you know, compelling subject line, all right. And I wrote my first press release about Jimmy Dennis, and I found it about a year ago, and it wasn't bad. It was pretty good. But uh, <laughs> now they're like, I was like, all right, mini publicist, it's pretty good. <laughs> I'd put that out today. But what we were naive about is we thought, you know, we would just put it out and like it was pre, it was before all these podcasts about wrongful convictions and everything. And within America, it was almost impossible to get attention for a person that was wrongly convicted while they were still convicted. It still is pretty difficult, but now there's more podcasts and more conversation and more awareness of the wrongful conviction. Back then, it, almost impossible. And here's two kids, 29 years old, with no any kind of degree, no legal degree, no whatever, up in Canada. What the heck are we going to do? Literally, we're two kids, 20 or 29, whatever, not kids, but barely, 28 years old, in a basement in Canada, like the CBC documentary later said, thinking, okay, so we put all this information up without even asking Jimmy's permission, which is like so bad now <laughs> when I think about it. Oh, my God. He said, and we didn't put his personal letter up. But we put all the legal documentation up and we wrote back and we're like, we don't know what we can do, but we made a web page. Here it is. And he was like, a what now? Oh, and we printed it all up and sent it to him because he heard something about it. it was still new, right? Well, here people, everybody can go and they can give it, you know, and here, give this out and all this stuff. And we started making the language and making the, inf you know, ultimately he'd sent way more information. Somebody, people got involved because of us. Jim and Tanya Sneed went and they literally went and paid, they went to the courthouse and paid whatever much money it is to get all the doc, literally the transcripts of the entire trial. So by a year in, we had a box of it. We were able to read through like every single thing. And, you know, by 2000, I don't know if it was because of the noise we were making and the conversation that was starting to happen. There was a law firm out of Washington, D.C., which is literally like a unicorn. If you know this stuff, this just does not happen. It's like they were literally looking, like they were just looking for a case of actual factual innocence to go pro bono on. They had already decided that around the nation. And because of the work we had done and the noise that got made, they heard about Jimmy Dennis. And so they took it on in 2000. And it was lawyer, like seven lawyers, literally. And they did, that's what it takes. And they did all the work in years and unraveled and found all kinds of more stuff and made all the arguments. It's still a legal nightmare and all that. Just that's how it works. But starting in 2000, they were doing the legal work and slowly but surely, they were discovering more stuff and things were starting to go our way. And then that would not go our way in the way the battle goes. But by 2012, 2013, we, you know, somewhere around there, 2013 or something, a really good decision came out with by Anita Brody. Where we pretty much thought the judge, he was going to be released like right away. We were shocked. There was another four years even after that. But by then we pretty much knew it would be really, really weird if he wasn't getting out, you know? And so then there I am. That's this way you come to my light bulb moment. So it's about 2012 now. He's still in prison. He's at, it's like year 14, literally year 14 of this journey. And every year he writes at the end of every letter, praying for the truth, 98, praying for the truth, 99, praying for the truth, 01, 02, 03, 04, 05. And now we're in 2012, but we're still believing. We're still fighting. We're still, but anyway, in our personal life, we had a kid like eight years ago. So now our son is like eight and we just left a big house that we had sold. And now we're in an crappy little apartment trying to figure it all out and stuff and I, so i'm sitting in the corner of a little rented apartment where all of our furniture was in storage so we literally had my computer like literally we like nothing in the living room was like one little chair my computer my desktop and that was it the internet and i'm like gonna do another 20 sales for whatever at that point i was working for a tele another I, I was good at, i continued to get telesales contracts even just as a, it was basically like a freelancer just doing anything entry-level sales from home because I would find entry-level sales jobs. I'd be like, oh, no, you know what? You should hire me. I'm really good, but you have to let me do it from home. I would convince people to do that. <laughs> it's pretty good. I don't know how now that I look back on it. And I would always have a job, whether it was I'd had a job selling carpet cleaning. I'd had a job selling ISO 9000. I had a job. Selling, at this point, I was working for in internal sales for a company, sort of doing telesales, but it was all you know to their customer, their past customers, selling ISO 9000, which I guess is important but it's not a passion of mine, right? So there I was, literally 20 calls an hour. Hi, this is Tracy calling from ISO 9. Blah, 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 nobody cares. Completely unfulfilling till five o'clock when I can do something I care about, right? And it just literally hit me. As, I don't know why, as I was about to, and this is still a couple of years before Jimmy got out, but we know that he's going to come out. So it wasn't even directly related to that. 
And I literally just realized, like in that moment, 15 years after my first press release, and we didn't even talk about how it wasn't just Jimmy. We'd gone deeper into the death penalty with the Canadian Coalition Against the Death Penalty so that the messaging that we did, that got successful media stateside where Jimmy didn't. So the messaging that we did just about the general death penalty and the fact that we had that website in America, that became the news. Whereas in Canada, we were interviewed about the death penalty as experts. In America, we were like the feisty Canadians who have this website about death row prisoners, you know? And so we were on talking about the death penalty on CNN. And again, no media experience other than our little radio show in Canada. No legal experience, right? We are not lawyers. We had live in another country. And we're 28 years old, 29. Because of my press releases, we get on, and, and our meet, and our website, CNN, MSNBC, Court TV, A&E, all these things. And not just as a novelty, we're interviewed on these things and holding our own. And if they ask tough questions, we're answering them well to the point where the interviewers are like completely respectful. And go, oh yeah, I see your point. So like, we're really good at media. So, but yet it took 14 years and there I am 14 years later when I suddenly went, huh, wait a minute. Like, it just literally occurred to me that all those skills that I've been doing to like media is a, is a skill that you can get way better than telemarketing that people will pay you for, <laughs> you know? So what was it that gave you that final realization? Wait a second. I should be doing this full time. That literally that one moment it all happened. Like I literally was sitting there down at my desk, ready to make another hour of call, like to start my day of telemarketing calls. And I literally remember going like that moment, going, wait a minute, like literally, huh, hold on. I'm not doing this anymore. And literally from the next day, I was like, okay, how do I, wh wh how do I do this? Like, Cause I clearly have these skills. And again, we have this thing in front of us, the computer and everything's on it. And so I just started researching like I do now and look for opportunities for my clients. And I found Elance, which was Upwork. I think it's called now Elance. I don't use it anymore, but like, like a freelance site where you can go and put your thing and put your price and there's a million jobs and they can hire you. And I ended up, I always say now life's a pitch. And I guess, you know, everything is a pitch. It's all about how you present yourself and you only need that one client and then you prove yourself. And I got that one client and proved myself. And then I got two, then I got three, all on Upwork. And then I took it off Upwork, you know, by because I met on Upwork people like Angela Sandler Williamson, Rosa Parks' cousin, who's still with me today as a client six years later. You know, so anyway, I, I got a, I just did really well doing some freelance, just using the freelance sites online for a short period of time. And then I started um, just telling people on LinkedIn, Hey, you know, it looks like you have an interesting project there. This is what I do. And now it's easy as pie, easy as anything. Cause like now I've got a list of recommendations from paying clients across industries a mile long. Right now I've got all these podcasts and interviews and there's no question of my expertise. But back then, nine, nine years ago, LinkedIn just told me not literally nine years ago this week, LinkedIn was telling me I was a freelancer and was just starting this. I just, you know, I just didn't let, I just had only the little bits that I had and I just started with it. And somehow, and I built that up to, and my friend was like, you know, you're way too big to be a freelancer. You need to start a company. So I went and just did like a little general partnership with my husband, which is like a solopreneurship only with two people, just like a small. And then this year, in the last two years, my business consultant has been like, you're punching way above your weight you need to be incorporated you have to be and i was scared to do it because like it's not my world and i don't understand all that and i just know my job but she made me you know not made me but she took me out of my comfort zone and made sure we incorporated so we just incorporated like three months ago and from a business perspective it's even better like things are going surprise crazy good so i don't know it's just weird <laughs> like i'm not a corporate minded person i'm not a money minded person but somehow i'm on this weird journey where like i've ended up as a publicist which is a job that people think is super cool and it is and it involves like vip travel and trips and parties and all that <laughs> what i was like a telemarketer <laughs> so but the funny thing is by the time jimmy dennis got out of death row in 2017 we laugh now and rolling stone was freaking out because he's a musician now and rolling stone did an interview and when I told them this story and framed it this way, they're like, I'm like, so we were telemarketers, entry level telemarketers helping some guy on death row. Like everyone's probably thinking we're crazy. Fast forward, you know, the whole 20 years it takes. But by the time he gets out in 2017, and by the way, walks right into the recording studio, makes a bunch of songs that Rolling Stone and BT and all these are now talking about. And, and, a, you know, literally, a, record company which doesn't care about his past is interested in him by the time he walks out to do all that those two crazy telemarketers are now literally international award-winning publicists 
perfect. And he's a musician. Guess what? He's my client now. So, so funny. I talk about like, I'm like, I'm going to keep talking about you anyway, because I've been doing that for 20 years. <laughs> so what was it like for you and Dave when you found out that he'd won his case? That he was going to be free. Well, we were. What was, what was the emotion you felt? Oh, oh, man. Well, we were talking every day like, through it, right? But yet there was so many times we thought it was going to happen, then he didn't. And then, like, it was just such a, ah, like, you know, even so when it came down to we knew he was going to get out, it was still like, okay, you know, like, this is really going to happen. We were waiting for it not to happen. And it was going to, you know, it, it was just such a weird thing, the, the last final bits, the way it happened, right? But I'll tell you, when he got out, oh, my God. His childhood sweetheart and his lawyers went to pick him up. And we always dreamed that we were going to be at the gates too and everything. But the way it happened with that weird time thing where you didn't know and you didn't kind of, that's why we ended up not being at the gates. But so his childhood sweetheart, the lawyers were there to pick him up to drive him nine hours home to be with his family, right? Because it's a long, he literally called his mom. Like when he got out, he called his mom. I'm out. I'm on the way home, you know, and then he called us. So literally, and we're waiting, like, I'm like, I, we got a note from the lawyers that we're going to pick him up with it, you know, so we're getting the note that, he, that he's okay. So apparently, I guess the lawyers would sign him out. We're waiting and, you know, I think it's happening. I don't know. I, but then, oh my God, that moment when he literally, I have a picture of it on Facebook, actually. I actually took a selfie because I'm selfie queen. But like, that literally, when he called, like when he phoned, we, and we talked to him, you know, in prison. But when he called, I was like, hello? And I'm like waiting to see, like, tell me, because I'm waiting to say, oh no, it's, I'm still in, you know. But when he's like, yeah. I'm, I'm like, what, you, are you out? And he's like, I don't even remember the word. But when I knew, like, when I processed that he was, like, outside in a car, I literally, like, no joke. It was like a movie when they say all your feelings come out. Like, I know what that means now. Because I literally burst into tears and I was laughing at the same time. Like, I was, like, sobbing and laughing. And I did not expect that. Like, it was literally, I didn't even realize how much emotion there was actually poured up in that. You know, it was crazy. It was just like. Oh, and we still talk about it now. We're still like, oh, we still talk almost every day. We talked to Earl. In fact, he was just messaging me while we were talking at 710. Okay. And I said, I'm on a podcast. And he said, okay. So <laughs> literally like 10 minutes ago. Before we dive into some of the stuff that's been happening since, do you want to give the listeners who haven't heard the story a bit of a background of, of what happened to Jimmy? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And also, you know, please go search the name Jimmy Dennis on any streaming platform to listen to his music right now, because for 20 years, he didn't have a voice, 25 years. And now he has a voice and he's using it and he's making really good music and music from the heart with a message like Tears This Year, which is talking about all the struggles everybody's had this year and has a theme in it, Never Never Give Up, which is what helped him through 25 years of death row. So yeah, what happened to Jimmy? So 1991, there was a girl called Shadal Williams, age 17, who was shot outside of a of a subway station in Philadelphia. Tragically, a young teenage girl shot for earrings outside of a subway station. And, and the city was, you know, cried out in pain, obviously, but this, like I said in the release, what, this was a high-profile killing and there was a lot of pressure on the police and ultimately they started going in there and doing their police thing and you know how all this stuff happens is a long and convoluted story and like it's all online and honestly people should i love people to go and look at the the documentation that we always send people to which is the legal decisions the most recent legal decisions and everything and i can send them to you so you can attach them to the bottom in the notes or whatever people want to look into it deeper but yeah but ultimately what happened is factually innocent and he was convicted through a lot of convolutions in a, a, a police department that since then has really been called to account and a lot of those people who caused him to be wrongly convicted have also been called out in cases of other people now where their bad behavior had been proven and they've had to you know so there's a lot of issues from the, the da there and the to the the police that were involved so yeah take a deep dive into that but ultimately what happened as a result is he was convicted in 1992 and he was he doesn't fit the description even from the stuff he sent us from his cell in 1998 we were like wait a minute he literally doesn't fit the description he's like way shorter different like light skin as opposed to dark skin they're just all so height weight every skin color everything was off so even from the very basics and then it gets worse and it gets worse and it gets worse so there was enough even looking at it at the beginning for us to go okay this is really wrong but ultimately how he experienced is you know, he didn't, everyone's like, oh, you're never going to get convicted, Jimmy. It's never going to happen and never going to happen. Uh, he was shot, you know, and then he's in court. This is not going well. He's obviously, he was convicted. He was in, literally shocked. He was stolen away from his life. He was about to be signed. You know, had a record contract with his band Sensation at the time. He was uh, a young father who had just had a child. 
father of two, but he just had his first, his, his, his girlfriend just had a baby. So, yeah, and then he was sent away. And, that, and we met him six years later. And from that time, he was, you know, writing and trying to get help and just reaching out and trying to get any attention. But it's very hard to do because all those innocence organizations, most of them have, they, you can't even talk to them until you're 10 years in, until you've passed this appeal and that appeal and all that. And there's just so much need to get a million letters and there's just nobody to help you. So he just kept on writing and kept on writing and found those opportunities until we suddenly found him. And once we found him, as he said, you know, things started to change. He started to get hope. People started to pay attention. That's when he, what he remembers as a starting point is, you know, when things started to change. And then we started, you know, we got other people involved by the website, you know, the, just putting it all up on the website and letting people know how disturbing it was and just hoping that somebody who could help would get involved. And before the lawyers got involved, you know, ultimately people from Chicago, got, Peoria got involved and some people from, you know, Germany and then some Amsterdam, Holland and some from Turkey. And so all, ultimately we had a little team of like 20 people that came and went through the years, but usually about 10 people at a time and mostly stuck around for the whole time. And, um, yeah, so there was, he had two execution dates through all that and came really close. But then ultimately, you know, there was still appeals. And because we had the good legal team, they were able to stop that from happening and continue to do more work. And, you know, it's a long and winding road. It's a long legal drama, you know, which if you really want the legal stuff, just go into the deep dive because it's great. It's all there. But, you know, on the emotional side, he didn't tell us what he was dealing with on a day to day level. I still hear him do interviews and I'll cry because we're like, wow. He, I mean, the, the, the scary, the hor horrible stuff happened to him in prison. It wasn't just being in a cell. He was abused and beaten up and threatened and all that stuff, you know, horrible. And he's a little guy. And he didn't tell us all that stuff because he wanted to keep us all positive and focused on what, what he thought really mattered, which was getting him out of there and getting him home, just getting him home and clearing his name, right? So ultimately, that happened. There was times when we thought, you know, when I thought, like I always believed it, but then I also thought, oh man, there's other, there was other times when I thought there's not going to, because I've seen other people get executed and I thought, no, no, there's no way this story is going to end, right? That way, this story is not going to end with him being executed because will not do well. If that happens, I still, I cannot imagine that being the end of that story because we knew he was innocent. We can't, you know, but ultimately, <laughs> thankfully they didn't get to kill our friend. As I said, even, <laughs> and you know, we, I was, where was I going through Ohio or something two years ago, 2019, we were going through Pennsylvania and I was like, just being silly but as we're going through pennsylvania or passing pennsylvania the way to ohio i'm like you lose <laughs> at the window i'm like you guys lose you didn't get to kill our friend okay we thought you'd be able to do it <laughs> you had the big weapon but yeah so ultimately the truth came out and the world you know agreed and knew that he's actually innocent and now he's we're waiting to hear back from the judge's decisions because philadelphia as bet just reported and sirius xm is the city of Philadelphia is doing everything they can to not do right by him, to not compensate him for that time. But the yeah, that's what they do. But, you know, he's got pretty much an airtight case in terms of, I mean, they know that he's innocent, but in terms of all the machinations that they're doing in here. The negligence. Yeah, and the, yeah. And they're, but they're basically trying to say, they've all already admitted all of it, but they're trying to say that they can do that. Essentially, they try their argument is something like, yeah, this we did this and this and this, but we're allowed to do that. You can't, we're not, you know, so, so they have admitted their wrongdoing. They're not saying they didn't do wrong. They have admitted their wrongdoing, but they are arguing that they should not have, for whatever legal reason, have to pay. But, you know, other people have already got their money and I'm sure he will too. And, you know, if there's any justice in the world, but I mean, like I say, and you hear this all the time, but I can tell you after dealing with this for 20 years, I don't care how much money you give that man. Cause like I said, I was with them for all those years. Not, you know, like we watched it. Praying for the truth in 1999, when we were 28 years old, when we got involved in this case, and he was 27, and then when we were 29, and he was 28, and then when we were 40, and he was 38, and then he gets out finally when we're 48, and he's 47. So I don't care how much money in the world they could give that man, because I know that I would not let you take my years from 21 till 50. You could die next year. All of us could. 
You know, his whole life was stolen. You know, that's my biggest fear is like, you know what I mean? Like two years from now, he gets in a car accident and dies and he had three years of freedom. So I don't care how much money they gave him. He missed his children. When we met him at first, he had little pictures of his daughters who were then like six and three. And he was saying, oh, when I get out, we're going to come to Canada and the kids will be playing on the lawn because we thought they'd still be kids. Well, by the time he got out, they're like 26, 29. They got their own kids. He's got several grandchildren now. Kids on the lawn. Those kids, are they're literally, I see their, their own children on Facebook, the same age as those pictures I have, right? So, so if, if you send us through some of those links you mentioned, we'll, we'll clip them to the show notes. Beautiful. And I'll also, we'll, we'll also put the Rolling Stone article, which does a, a great job of summarizing it. I really, it's, it's hard to story, say. Yeah. It's hard. Yeah, it's hard to say. I enjoyed the read, but I think you know where I'm going. the The end was what he deserved. It's a, a crazy story. Absolutely. And everyone says it's a Hollywood story, and they, and people have come around. There, you know, definitely been conversation, and he's not just going to give up his life story for like other people to profit on, and then you know he, he's not going to have like a slave kind of thing going on. You know. Yeah. He lived this story and he wants to make it and the, and the music is part of, of all of it. And, you know, so he's very future minded about having a voice and being an artist. And one thing I want to say, this is, he mentions in every podcast now, and this is really cool. When you search Jimmy Dennis's name right now, the first thing that comes up, it's, uh, well, right now the BET article comes up, but when you search, you know, in Google, it comes up R and B artist. And then it says, you know, prisoner and all that before it was like death row prisoner. And now when you search, it says R&B artists. Like he said, we already changed the narrative. We changed the narrative and brought him back already to where he was supposed to be before they stole his life in 1991 when he was about to sign that record contract at age 21. So we're focused now on, you know, fin- in getting this story out there, you know, because there continue to be injustices. And Jimmy, like we were then, is active in working, you know, to shine light on these kinds of injustices. But in terms of his story, I want to see him get his money and that compensation. And, and hopefully, you know, at some point we can close the chapter on telling his story as that story of injustice and tell it more as the backstory of this incredible artist, you know, who has so much to say to the world because that's, then they won't have been able, then they didn't steal that from him because they, that's the one they can't, you know, if he can bring that back, then they didn't steal that from him. Right. That would be the narrative we want. Exactly. Is the story of Jimmy Dennis, the yeah, artist. Exactly. That's a, a beautiful story. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> right. The so one of the fun parts that you shared in that article about Jimmy and and now that he's now that he's one of your clients it's probably still the same. You talked about the fact that Jimmy would give you all your assignments <laughs> even though he was in jail. Oh yeah. Can you take us through can you take us through what that was That's like? That's my favorite. I used to laugh with the with that she was talking about how somebody once was like, you know, he thought that somebody in our team once was treating him like he was kind of a, a cause and he shouldn't be like super appreciative of everybody. And I was like, that's so weird because that's never what I got. And that's what I really actually loved. Like if you'd asked me 20 years ago when we were doing all this, he was never like, he was always grateful. Like, obviously you're doing work for me and you're a stranger. Thank you. Right. But he was, but also he was like, this is just an injustice. And why aren't other people doing it? Because he would have been doing this. He would have been doing that same work if he knew about it for other people. You know what I mean? So he was always like, we were his team. We were his friends. Like, you know, he would ask us and know about our little things going on in our life, just even while he was dealing with this crazy stuff in prison that he wasn't talking about. He'd ask, remember to ask about your mother and that operation she had and all that, because he actually did care about that stuff, right? So to me, he was never a cause. He was always like, you know, a friend. And there was time he wasn't afraid, and I'm glad if we, you know, if we were on the wrong track, we had our 50-minute call and he had to tell us something, he wouldn't be afraid to tell us that. We don't have to be afraid to make Tracy mad that you're not sufficiently grateful. <laughs> you know what I mean? It wasn't like that. It was like a real. Pro- so he was literally like a project manager, and he had 15 minutes because he couldn't call. Like in, later on, he got. I think like now they have phone cards. So if you buy them a phone card, they have different. They'll bring you know. There's some different procedures now. So, but in, for most of it, the first 10 years, he literally had 15 minutes once a week. He would get his phone. That was it. He would call us because his family didn't have long distance and also because they couldn't do all the things we could do so he would call us and tell us tell my mom this have the have my mom go and do this for the girls tell this that tell he would worry all about us he was like raising his daughters from there worrying about all this family stuff and you know all that and then at the same time any legal stuff and any of this and we had no time for the niceties we literally had a 15 minute call where it's like 
I'll never. If anybody's ever dealt with prison, this call is coming from a maximum. It's like a voice, like the bell lady, but it's like this voice. This call is coming from a maximum security correctional facility, and it says that like every thirty seconds, like you every three minutes or something. And I guess it's so people can't scam and call, and you don't know you're getting a call from a prison or something, right? But literally, like every three minutes in the call, it's like this call is coming from a maximum security correctional facility, and then you only have fifteen minutes, and every so literally, you're like, so he'd be like, okay. Here, okay, here, do this, do this, do this. Okay, got it, got it, got it, bye. And there has to be a letter because there's no time for anything else. So he would literally be just like giving us our assignments. And so I, I still laugh now and he cracks up whenever. I'm like, okay, boss. And then he's like, what do you mean? I'm like, you don't remember? You'd be telling us, you know, I need you to do this. I need you to do this. <laughs> he start laughing. And I'm like, well, what else were you going to do? Like, you know. So he, was a, so he was a good project manager. That's what I've been saying recently. Someone said, how did you guys stay involved for 20 years? And and I said, I was thinking about it because it's in terms of a project, right? Because it was a business podcast. And I was like, huh, that's a good question because how do you stay involved on any project for 20 years? How do you keep your team involved on any project for 20 years, let alone something where there's no, you're not getting paid. There's, you know, you keep losing, <laughs> you know, there's like, you know, he's still alive, but you're not getting, he's not getting out. Right. And then I said, wow, you know, if anything, honestly, he really, really, Jimmy should be on these business podcasts talking about that. How did you keep, and then I mentioned that to him the other day, because we are big joke now is I'm like, I'm doing all these podcasts and I, so now I get off the phone and I'm like, hey, I just did another episode of the Jimmy Dennis Business Show. <laughs> he cracks up because when I'll be doing a very serious business podcast. But whenever they ask me, how did you get started in PR? I'm always like, OK, let me tell you the answer to that question. <laughs> you know, and I can't help but tell you that's the story. The answer. And it ends up being a good business story because they always, you know, t- there are and, and business audiences are just like, whoa, that's not what they expected. But um, so anyway, I ended up telling Jimmy that the other day. And I'm like, you know, I was t- talking to somebody about how you were like a project manager. And he got really, and I said, you know, and they should interview you about being a project manager, but how you kept everybody together. And he got really serious. And he said, I knew my job. He got really serious about it. like, he stopped laughing. He said, no, I knew my job was to keep you guys focused, to keep you guys hopeful that's what he talked about not why you didn't talk about the bad stuff that was going on day to day he goes i knew if i talked about all the bad stuff that was going on day to day that it would be too much for some people he go he even said like he thought like he goes i knew i would lose people on the team you know because it would be too much so he buried his pain and he buried the troubles that he was dealing with absolutely just just to keep moving forward yeah so look at that that still makes me cry thinking about like i'm like oh man that was you know Heavy, heavy stuff, and he was traumatized. Like I can feel your emotion, yeah. even, even even through the through the call and seeing yeah, it. It's so crazy. I it's crazy. completely it's understand. Yeah. The so Tracy, you know, fast forward, you realize I should be in PR. I should be a publicist. I should be uh, helping people in that way, and that's my passion. You do freelancing for a period of time, and then you decide I'm going to start my own company. What made you finally decide to start the agency and be your own boss? My friend, for unless she was my friend, my friend, um, Sheila Collins from Wisconsin. And um, we had actually, we were going to start a business together a couple of years before, before legalization in Canada. We were looking at starting a, a cannabis lounge together, not to sell cannabis, but there's some like lounge, like a bar kind of thing. Only you would be like a consumption lounge. People would bring their own cannabis in. There would be a, a safe place to smoke, like an alcohol free social space, basically. And there was a model in Toronto for that. There was several of them at the time going on in Toronto that were eventually a kind of medical it came out of the medical cannabis community basically and my friend from wisconsin was like oh my god that's awesome and she you know invested ten thousand dollars and we got a little storefront and we were going to do that and then just had some you know if things aren't meant to be they aren't meant to be the location ended up not working out because there was going to be a there was like a dry cleaner next door so the smoke would have come in so we had to we would have had to do like just a whole bunch of renovations and then we found out the space was going to be totaled in two years which it is now for condos because that's what happens in toronto right so we ended up saying okay well clearly that's not going to work just whatever and then she was like you know, and i'd say uh, what i was paying the bills with was my freelancing at the time right my and she was like, you know, you're really good at, at that. You know, you really, we didn't, that business didn't work out, but you really need to start a business. And I was like, oh, well, whatever, you know. And she's like, no, 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 you really need to. And she ended up just kept bugging me about it and bugging me about it. She was, and she's like, I will literally pay for you to go and start your business. So she ended up paying for me to go and would register my business. 
as a birthday present or something. Right, so registered my small little general partnership, which I had for five years, and I still continued to work as a freelancer, basically the same in the same manner in the same way. And then it was my business consultant Jane, who's my friend and client, who I also met her from. I love the Beatles growing up. John Lennon was the single biggest influence in my life. And so when I had the opportunity to work on the London Beatles Festival, which is in Canada, I was like, oh, you guys need to hire me. And they're like, oh, we don't have much funds. And we we're oh, my God, sorry. I literally had 150 Beatles books when I grew when I was growing up. You need to hire me so that that investment in my brain and time has like a business purpose. And I can tell my father, you know, it was for work. It was research. <laughs> so they ended up hiring me for three years. And Jane was their CFO. And now she ended up, you know, she just saw what I was doing for so long and she was saying like again you're punching way above your weight you're like one person like a freelancer you've got these kind of clients you've got this kind of my bio is getting better and better and bigger and bigger and like you know most publicists can't hold a candle to my own personal history in, in PR right and she was just like you need to incorporate and so finally I, she bugged me long enough about it and got me out of my comfort zone and we only just incorporated this year in, in, in COVID in August Actually, and then by the time we got our papers back from the government, because everything was slow, it was October. So we've we not even been incorporated for six months. And now with running the agency, you're the CEO. Your husband, Dave, is the COO. How does that dynamic work for the two of you between work and home? So basically, it's... um and the titles have changed now. Since once we when we incorporated, it was actually now it's we're co-founders, and I'm the managing director, and he's a director, and and I guess the CF, you know, the the, the financial guy. So he's a numbers guy, and he actually is good at a lot of what I do too, because we built the CCADP together, right? And the, the, right. that work. So like the the thing is, people forget it wasn't like we both had no history in PR, and we both did all that messaging with the death penalty, and we both wrote those press releases, and we both did TV, and then you know he was working outside of the home, I was working inside the home doing that those telesales jobs. So when I started to do like the like a freelancer. That was became my income. He was still doing his small income outside the home, blah, 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 until it got to the point where we needed to hire. I would need to hire somebody to come and support me. And then I was like, no, you need to leave your job to come and, be, you know, so he was out there. So that's this is the only thing we didn't build from the ground up together, but we really did. Like, you know what I mean? All the skill sets that you developed, you developed together. Exactly. And so there was a perfect partnership. Yeah. And so when I said, no, I need, he, you know, only the, the funny thing is, but I'm bad at finance. I don't know any, the job that he was doing out of the home and just, you know, was no longer telesales over the years. He ended up doing, um, accounts receivables, which is perfect. Cause now he can, do, so he does my books now. He does all the financial. He's a Bitcoin guy. He's an investment guy too, like a Bitcoin kind of stuff now. Small level investment that did really well for him in the, in the Bitcoin. So now he looks after. Stuff like that. So, and some of it, he does some of the other stuff too, but mostly I deal with clients one on one. And then he helped me with strategy. Like he's really good, like me with strategy. We're both brilliant at that. So we talk out a lot of the, you know, like I deal with the clients. I'm the face of the company. Then we talk about the project. We strategize together. He does some of the backroom work. I do most of the writing. And, you know, yeah, it's, it works out really well. And are you able to leave the work at work and the home at home? Or do you find that sometimes it just blends and <laughs> what might be an argument in the office becomes an argument in the, in the dining room? There's no home. And, okay. and it's not even so much the relationship thing. It's me. Like, I have no separation, period, between my work and my life. It's real. Like, and I'm lucky in some way because, I, I mean, it's, it all bleeds together because my activism, I mean, like Jimmy Dennis is one of my clients. You know what I mean? So that bleeds from my activism work. And even the diverse clients I have and the passionate projects that I, you know, if I'm awake, it's a joke. I mean, my, my kids are always like, put the phone down. But honestly, if I'm awake, the first thing I do, I'm still in bed. I'm checking my messages and sometimes answering them. And I'm up till like two in the morning working on, on stuff. So honestly, if I'm awake, I'm usually working or checking, but it, it sounds bad, but it's like, there's no, it's because it's just my day. It's all this stuff I care about and I do, and, you know, it's never like, oh, I have to go sit down and work. So we, we talk, we're up at 11 talking about things where there's never like, we don't stop work at six or something, you know? But it's not like it's work either. It's literally like, it's all the same thing, <laughs> you know? So what I'd love to do now, I found some quotes from some of your past articles okay. that I personally really enjoyed. And so I thought I'd read some of them and then have you 
share with the listeners the why behind that quote and what you think they can learn from it. And one of the first ones is just do it. Yes, I should have paid attention to the message in that ad. One of the most powerful things I have learned with time is just do it for real. Don't wait for someone else to notice you or give you permission or decide you can. It's up to you to decide you can. And there is no reason to wait until you're in your 40s like I did. Yep, exactly. <laughs> Why do I say it? Yeah, absolutely true. I mean, we like, and I see this every day, not just in my own life, but with clients. People will ask things like, well, when is the right time to go do media? Or when is this? Or when are, you don't, you don't have to ask for permission for all of that. Like, just believe in yourself. Honestly, just do it. Take a step. If you don't know how to, you know, to get to do the whole path, take one step because it's just simple math. You know, when, if you take a step forward, you see that, you know, you've already gotten this far and you see how much closer you are to the goal, right? And, and you are legit closer to the goal. And plus you don't know who you're going to meet that wasn't behind, it wasn't over there, but they're over here. So always be moving forward. Be confident in yourself and, and, Again, don't wait for permission. Like I, I'm, you know, I got the crazy red hair. I'm the overweight girl. There are a ton of people who would never, wouldn't have hired me for that reason, you know. But now they're putting me on stages and and you know, paying me money to tell them how to do it. So just if you believe you can do something, that's all it takes. You believe you can do something, do it. What do they say? And they, they proved in the Gladwell book or whatever it is. I can't remember the exact numbers, but they said something like. No matter what it is, if you spend a hundred hours doing something, you're really good at it. If you spend a thousand hours doing something, you're like genius level at it. So what do we spend our time doing? Watching Netflix. So we're really good at watching Netflix, you know, or, or, you know what I mean? Like I, I spend my time doing all this other stuff. So I get to be really good at that. Not because I'm better or brilliant or whatever. It's what we look at or we all learned when we were kids. When you're riding the bike, you know, that's the direction you're going to go in. Wherever you look when you're riding the bike, that's true in real life too. What are you paying attention to? Are you waiting for someone to, like, no one is going to come. You have to be ready. No one is going to come and tell you. It's funny too. You reminded me, Jimmy Dennis told us 20 years ago, you guys should be parents. And we're like, oh, someday, you know, when we have money and we're, you know, when we have, literally, I remember saying to him, oh, we're not ready for that yet. You know, when we have money and when we get, we have kids now, but, um, and my son's almost 18. So this is 20 years ago. I remember him saying, well, you never feel ready. You just do it. And then you, you are ready. You know, and it's so true with kids, with like with parenting. Nobody ever feels ready to be a parent. You always feel like that 15 year old inside until you have the kid, until you're yeah, responsible. Until you're there. And then you are. Same as that. You know, sometimes you have to just, you, you inside, you feel like that little 15 year old or you think, oh, you think those other people that are doing things are better than you or different than you. The ones that you see on TV and the ones that are getting awards and you're just here that again, they're just the ones who did it. So you just start doing it. So given that, it's a bit of a challenging question as I even think through it, because as you said, it's always about going forward. So it's a little harder to put the rear view mirror on. But if you look back and knowing what you know now and giving yourself permission to just do it, what might you have changed or what might you have done earlier than you did? The business. I really wish I'd thought of that. You know, stop. I mean, there's no reason that I should have sat there for 15 years working for telemarketing and I could have been building my own business at the same time, you know, building an income. Can you imagine what the, the all that we were able to accomplish with literally, you know, when we needed to borrow $20, what we would be able to do if we had any kind of money or any kind of power, you know, that kind of power behind our advocacy. But then when I think of that too, that I think maybe we, if we had money, maybe we would have done things the way everybody else did them. And maybe we wouldn't have been the feisty and this and that. We wouldn't have been clever and strategic and who knows. So I don't know. I don't really regret anything. I think it was a good path. I think spending my thirties trying to free a guy from death row and then the end, you know, he ultimately was free isn't, isn't, you know, it's good. But ultimately, you know, on a personal level, I don't know why I didn't have that light bulb moment. <laughs> Before I was 41, realizing that I actually had, you know, hugely marketable skills. And I just continued to do like a telemarketer's job because it was convenient. So that's ridiculous. And again, that goes back to the believe in yourself. Start to re realize what you have. It never even occurred to me. So that really resonates. And I think I'm just going to say it to really emphasize it for our listeners is just believe in yourself. You can do anything you put your mind to as long as you do it. Watch less Netflix, watch less YouTube, just get out and do that thing that drives you. It's a great message to share, Tracy. It's true. 
You also said, I'm not the kind of publicist who will spin bullshit into gold for a dollar <laughs> or even for a million dollars. Where did I say that's got- true? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, for- I forget the exact source, but uh, I got into this work to amplify messages that are important. And that's why I continue to do it. I'm grateful and lucky that sticking to the same values and ethics that brought me to this work in the first place, far from being a barrier to success, it has actually helped me to reach the top of my field. So can you tell us how you use that type of thinking and that type of values-based system to drive the clients you pick today, Tracy? See, I'm so lucky that's happened because that's just me being, that's just my stubborn Tracy. You know, I'm never going to change. You can't tell me I have to stop being a social justice activist or stop having red hair or stop doing anything to succeed. So I just kept on being, you know, and I guess I'm lucky that none of it had impeded me. But while I'm very careful on who I, I mean, just in general, if I don't like, you don't have to be changing the world. A lot of my clients are world changers, but you don't have to be changing the world. I can just resonate with you and you can be a client. You know, I like, it's, I like the person. I like what they're doing. I like, but what they can't be doing is putting out negative messaging or, you know, if I don't like, if I don't like your current presence that you have, like, you know, we already, already have forums in a presence. And if I don't like what you're doing with, you know, this, you know, your social media right now, for example, I'm not going to amplify your message and, and allow you to, put more negativity in the world than you already are. So I like positive things that I, I mean, not positive in terms of Pollyanna, you can be talking about issues and stuff, but I like people who are doing good things, not just putting bad things out there. I like people who are provide. if there's going to be they're providing solutions, they're providing, you know, so I'm really, I mean, I want to resonate with my clients and people don't always know what that means. Cause I work, I have 40 clients. I work across industries. I work with all different personalities. They, they don't all have to be like like me. They don't all have the same opinions as me, but they're all ethical people. They're all absolutely, you know, they wouldn't hire me if they weren't, if they, if they, that wasn't their personality. You know, I'm very, yeah, like, I mean, I'm very heart centered still. And I'm never going to be, I would, I'm never going to be a bottom line dollar kind of person. That's never going to be me. Always going to evaluate the success of my business in terms of what messaging we're putting out and what we're doing that my activist heart in the twenties, when I was in my twenties would be pleased with or not. And even, you know, as my thinking develops, as I, you know, it's really strange because right now I'm in a position where I'm thinking that now I want to start becoming a job creator. Okay. Now I'm corporate, which I used to think was a bad word. Right. But I realized it doesn't have to be because it doesn't mean I'm going to be a corporate. And so now I'm thinking this year I want to become a job creator. I actually thought, oh yeah, wouldn't it be neat to be able to take other people who like me had no history in this stuff, who had no schooling for this, but who would be good at it and who would have a passion for it, who could develop a really cool life like I have now and make that a thing. And then at two in the morning one day when I was sitting there having my Canadian joint (laughs) and this thought came to me, I was like, this is where I was. And then I was like, wait a minute, I got to challenge myself there. Is that me changing or is that actually true? So I had this like thought, I was like, that's kind of an activist thing, isn't it? You know, now I can be a job creator and give people good job, good, good jobs and a good life. And then I thought, wait a minute, that's not an actor. Hold on. And I had to sit there and challenge myself, like, cause I had the thought that that could be an activist thing, improving people's lives and all that. Then I was like, yeah, but giving people a job, hold on now, that's not so your corporate lady giving someone a job is now an activist. Thing. Hold on, you know. So I like literally challenge myself all the time to make sure I still am that a heart centered ethical person, and not I don't because we all change. We like as we get into different circumstances, we have different people around us and different friends, and you know your thoughts start to change. So all of a sudden now. I know all these more successful people where, you know, my past life, all of my peers are all struggling. And now I know all these more successful people. So I see this thing differently. So you have to really, when you, you know, people around you change your way of thinking sometimes. And you have to always realize perspective because they'll change your way of thinking. I mean, because you'll see things in a different way. So now you might have a different perspective and go, oh, what I thought there wasn't quite true. But now. And then you have to always realize, but what you're thinking here and what these people are, everything's perspective too. So I always think it's important to challenge like, hey, I've learned something new here and I can incorporate that, but is that still ethical? Does that still follow? Huh? Yeah, I see how that deal, like check check yourself. (laughs) And Tracy, something you mentioned there can be a, a whole other conversation. So we don't necessarily have to dive into it, but you raise a very good point about money about business because a lot of people who have different backgrounds they may look at a business or they look at a corporation or they look at people with money 
And there's, for some reason, just this association of immorality or this association of unethical, right? And I think I'm starting to going to see that. And I'm going to start to see that because my, my circumstances are changing from my incredible hard work, which it makes me laugh because people like who've known me for 10 years when I was down there, they must be looking at me going, how the heck, what? You know, how is she doing this? But if they're paying attention, they see how I've been doing it because they see my 18 hour nights and my 20 clients and my, all that work and all that work. But now I've started to think now that my business is getting more successful in my December and then my January and now my February were even more successful, even in the time of COVID, right? I'm starting to think, oh man, I I can see how the narrative is going to start to change. Who people who don't know me, who didn't see all that 10 years, who just meet me now are going to be like, oh yeah, okay, okay, publicist lady that doesn't know any thing about whatever who don't we like realize that literally eight years ago i had to message my friend sue because i had to ask her to borrow twenty dollars to the end of the week mm-hmm. and that mm-hmm. her lending me that twenty dollars made a difference yeah do you also you know flip the coin do you look back and say some of those assumptions i may have had about people who were in that position may have been wrong absolutely And I think what everything we learned in this process is the more we know, the more we learn. Now I'm about to quote a Dr. Seuss poem, (laughs) but the, the, the farther we'll all go because we reduce that level of ignorance and we just have a, we have visibility into someone else's perspective, someone else's journey. Yeah, exactly. In terms of perspective. And I was even talking about that in terms of what's going on in America right now and like people that I wouldn't want to sit at the table with and stuff, you know, like, you know, racists or whatever. But I was saying it's true. We're getting so polarized now and further and further away that if we don't start to like, I mean, and I'm talking to myself too, because again, like I don't want the people that I don't want to sit down for reasons that I think are good reasons. I don't want to sit at the table with them. But everybody thinks their reasons are good, even when they're misguided and damaged and even when they're completely misguided, like on, working on operation, you know what I mean? Like even when they're operating on information that is false or they're operating from fear, or whatever, humans don't do things that they don't think are the right thing, unless someone's really like a bad guy. But generally, like all those people that we think of as opposition, all those you know people that I you know don't want to sit at the table with because they're raised or whatever, those people, they're not thinking they're bad people, right? They're think, they, they are coming from a different... So unless we stop throwing bricks, and looking for reasons like, and again, and I'm talking to myself too, because we, we, even when we do it from the right reasons, it's not helping right now. And then people are so polarized right now. I think, especially in America, we're seeing that before you guys even ask each other's name or know anything about each other, people are already looking to see what do I see behind you or on your shirt that might indicate if you think something differently than me so I can throw a brick at you? What are some signs? Are you That's a lefty? Right. Are yeah. you from the right? Are you a left? Are you a, a this? Are you a that? Are you a gay? Are you a tra- like they're looking for when the fact is it doesn't matter. Even the people that you are most diametrically opposed to, the worst Hitler in the world, the worst human being in the world and you, when it comes down to it, like, you know, even the worst human, 98% of the two of you are the same, About 98%, you have head, you have eyes, you have whatever, physically, you have 99% of the same, DNA, you have 90% of the DNA the same, when you were a little baby and you, you know, b- before anything happened to damage that brain or whatever, you were the same crying, that's, you know what I mean? We are human beings and 99% were the same as each other period. Mm -hmm. And so we have to find those similarities and try to, you know, to talk to each other instead of whatever the heck is going on where I don't even know what's going to happen anymore. And I was bringing this up in a podcast in India today. I brought it up about America, right? But it's also Canada too, but America writ large. And then I said, and India, I'm talking to you there in India. I've never been to India, but I know the case, you got racism there because the case system is like, still exists. And he's like, oh yeah, there you go. So we have to like, you know, it's. I think it's worldwide. And I, I do believe that it despite is. the many benefits of the internet, that social media, echo chambers, peddling an us versus them mentality allows a lot of these platforms to grow. And one of the downfalls is it does create, to your point, it creates a bit of a desire to not sit down at the table with each other. But the only way to ultimately reduce that divisiveness is for us to sit down at the table and, and Tracy, I was even thinking, you know, I was thinking of people who, whose message I read or see, and, you know, I might agree with 70%, 80% of what these people say, but 10 to 20%, maybe it's a little too to the right. Maybe it's a little too this, a little too that. And I start to think, 
Could I have them on for an episode? Could I talk to them in a conversation? And can I just ignore, not necessarily ignore, because maybe we can dive in to that 20 to 30% yeah, yeah. that I don't agree with to seek to understand each other, yeah, yeah. to learn, right? Yeah. And, you know, it ties a little bit to your to what you're saying about values in that specific quote that I don't necessarily have to work with them, but I can maybe learn from them and maybe ask some questions to understand them better. Yeah, we just, I mean, how do how else do we? I just don't know what else to do. But, you know, we're not getting any better by... Like things are not improving and things are getting more polarized and we just have to figure it out. So the, the last quote I'll throw at you and then, and then ask you some questions uh, about the magic of publicizing, because a lot of listeners probably want to know, how do I get my message out there? But the last one, and I, I think I've got a sense of this through our call and your personality, don't let anything or anyone intimidate you. Walk right in like you belong, because you do. On my second trip to Hollywood, I walked right into any group of people that looked interesting at one high-profile party and was accepted and made great connections every time. How can people use that in their daily life? How can they own their strengths and promote themselves, Tracy? So it all honestly comes back down to that, and it always sounds like it's just a little thing, but really, truly believe in yourself and stop questioning yourself. Because when you walk into that Hollywood room, if you're walking in on or any room, you know, it's really you that's questioning, you know, more than anybody else, it's you that's judging yourself or you that's worrying if you fit in or you that's questioning yourself. Everybody else is doing the same thing usually. So... You know, when you think you walk in and the spotlight's on you and everybody's looking and wondering, you know, what you're doing wrong, well, they're not usually paying that much attention to you, you know? So just don't feel... I mean, don't micromanage yourself so much. Honestly, it just comes down to believing it. Like, it's simple as that. The Hollywood party one, same thing happened the second time I went to Hollywood, actually, and I'd already been to the W Hotel the first time, and I happened to be in the neighborhood, like, walking by the W Hotel and was thinking to myself, oh, I have to go, you know, I had to go into the bathroom. I think it'd be cool to go and take some pictures because I remember they had a, a big thing about the doors. You know, the doors, lucky little lady in the city of light. They had a big painting there. And I remember for the first time, I thought, oh, I'll go get a selfie there. And so when I passed by the W Hotel, I was going to do that. Only I saw they had a big event there with the doorman and all that stuff. And it clearly was an industry party. And I was like, oh, well, I still really want to go. And, you know, I really do have to go to the bathroom. And I want to go get that selfie. So I literally just walked in there. And I was thinking to myself, you know what? I'm just going to go over there to the bathroom and get that selfie and i walked in with that like in like in my head i just had no reason not to do that it would have been ridiculous for that guy to stop me when i was trying to go to the bathroom myself you know so i just walked the the door there was a doorman there i literally walked right by the doorman looked at him nodded at him acknowledged him and he nodded at me and i walked right in and then i was at the party and so then i went and got the selfie that i wanted to and then i went and you know ordered a drink and i went and sat there these big tables with just all these groups talking to each other and I just went literally and sat right beside somebody. And the first thing they said to me is, oh, you look like somebody I should know. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I'm right in the conversation. So, like, literally, just don't be afraid. You are someone they should know. Why not? If you're there, you have a reason to be there wherever you are. If, you you know, it's you're at your workplace, you're at your, don't be afraid of the seat at the table. Don't be afraid to, to, to be quoted in the media, which whenever I meet an expert because of my expertise and background in media, I'm always like, geez, why aren't you, why aren't there articles quoting you and stuff? And people are like, huh? Why would anybody quote? me why would and then i realized there's that divide where people really don't they again they see the people in media as someone different although those are other people those people getting awards or people getting quoted are different than me i'm just i'm just this i'm just that and they don't see you know how to do that or that, that or that there'd be any interest in them doing that and that brings us to something that ties to that is you're young, you're starting a new venture, or, or you're 43, you're starting a new venture, you have limited funds. What's the easiest way for people to get their message out there? I say media. It doesn't You don't need any money for media. It's uh, like it, advertising, you need money for that, all that stuff, marketing, and who knows that. I built my whole business without ever, ever, ever placing a single ad. So I say media. <laughs> and the way to do that is if you don't know how, I mean, start doing things like building. There's a lot of ways to build your thought leadership if there's nothing out there. Um, obviously there's blogs, but also if you go and write an article on medium, people think that's like the Huffington Post, but really medium, you can just write an article and it looks like an article and it's easy to do. And it's a great way to start. 
Follow things like Help a Reporter Out, Harrow, and uh, Source Bottle, which similar to Matchmaker and the podcast matchup services where we met, Help a Reporter Out and Source Bottle. Every single day, you literally see hundreds of requests from major media, things like, you know, literally Reader's Digest, Rolling Stone, New York Times, The New Yorker, everything you can think of. And they're looking for quotes from people across industries or for regular people on just literally every single day, different stuff. And I have gotten clients placed in all those magazines I just mentioned in there on that, on Oprah.com and the New York Times and New Yorker and Reader's Digest just by responding to, you know, readers, reporters on deadline that are looking for quote on blah, blah, blah. So those, and you don't have to have any experience. You don't have to, they don't care if you've been quoted 9 million times or not. They only care that you have a good quote and that you're an expert. So you want to perfect your little pitch. I always say life's a pitch with a P, not a B. And you want to, perf- you know, perfect, it's true. You want to, uh, it's a good one. You want to uh, perfect your pitch, which is your little about me, why you're an expert, why, you know, you could say, that, you know, Clint has a great perspective on people from across America because every day he speaks to people about, you know, like your little why, what you do and and that. So that's a great way to start right there. And that's free. Those are, there's no cost. Those are things you can't. And if you do have a marketing budget, hire, take a little bit of it and hire, call me for one month and say, show me what you can do, girl. Ciao. Like I work at, you know, everywhere across the world and I do give discounts for entrepreneurs and stuff who see me on these podcasts because I realize I do so much educating about this. And then the, you know, the mainstream price of PR when they contact the big PR house is 3000 bucks a month, three month minimum, which is out of the, it's not possible for most entrepreneurs, right? So I started, I don't want to make, get the entrepreneurs all excited about doing it and they can't do anything. So I started some offers where basically for under a thousand dollars a month, and there's two different price points, under a thousand where anybody who needs any messaging can talk to me about, and as long as they're ethical, awesome people, <laughs> then they can talk to me about getting their messaging out there. And I love it if, you know, if you, and most people are like, yeah, sure, let me see. But honestly, doctor, lawyer, candlestick maker, you mow the lawns, you clean the toilets at a hotel, every single person has a story and there's media for you. So that's what I do is preach, don't buy ads, start telling your story. Love it. So you have a new book coming out later this year. Can you dive into the details for us and give the listeners a taste of what's coming? Yeah, it's a lot like what I've been talking about in all the podcasts, basically. Not this one so much as the you know, entrepreneur-based ones. Um, it's called Get Wrapped, Build Your Brand with Effective Public and Media Relations. And I was at, it's business-focused because I was asked to write that by a, a business publisher, my client, actually, Lou Bayer, who one of my first clients that I got all those years ago when I was a freelancer. And we made her book, The 30% Solution, a business bestseller on Amazon. And then after that, she decided to start her own publishing company, basically. And now she's got something like 30 different authors, all with soft business kind of stuff. So she literally asked me to write the book on PR since we had helped make her book in a business bestseller. So she asked me to write it and I've been working on it for a while. And, you know, because I'm so busy with other stuff, it's not out yet. But I'm really glad it was delayed because I wanted to add, I ended up wanting to add a couple of chapters based on stuff that happened in 2020, just observing, you know, in one case, you know, someone who had previously built a really good public platform, done a lot of good work, and then they had a melt, a personal meltdown, and it happened all over their public image, and now I don't know be able to go back on that. So I kind of wanted to put a little chapter in there about being careful not to do that, and also uh, some commentary on, you know, those moments of people, you think you're doing a great thing on social media, you're mad or whatever, and you think you're you're really telling them, and you you just send that press send, turns out everybody's watching, and maybe you the perception they're getting of you is not the one that you want to leave. So I also put some added commentary just about like what not to do and how people can damage the public profile that they did, you know, spend so hard, spent so long building pretty easily by, you know, some bad behaviors. Yeah, that makes sense. So s- some questions that I ask all of the guests that come on, Tracy, when, when you think about yourself, what's your superpower? Communication. <laughs> I guess, but uh, that's an obvious one, I guess, when it comes to a publicist, but, but it really is. And also, I guess I, I like dealing with communicating with different personalities, like understanding people. And I always try to really see where the other person's coming from to a fault, probably, you know, like I really try to see, well, why would they say that? <laughs> why would they do something so bizarre? Why would they say that and try to actually figure out, you know, what, what their perspective is? So I don't know, people, I care about people, I guess. I don't know. I'm a good communicator. I think that's a good superpower. 
But really, I think I, then, I just, I mean, I know that I can like accomplish stuff. I was lucky to learn at 15 or whenever it was, again, whether it was John Lennon that sent me off on doing stuff on my own or whatever. But from really young, I learned to raise my voice and stuff. And I learned that every single time I did, people listened and it worked and something happened. And I wasn't, you know, privileged. I didn't have a PR company then and I wasn't, you know, whatever. But like I learned really young, never to be intimidated. Like that article said, I guess that's probably my superpower is, you know, it doesn't matter. You can't, is like, no, (laughs) you can't, I'm not going to be, you know, I'm not going to be intimidated. No, I don't care. Tenacity. That's, that's come out a number of times in the, a number of times in our conversation. So (laughs) there you go. I'm glad you, you you chose a last second pivot from the communication to to highlight the tenaciousness. Yeah, when I thought about it more, because communication, yeah, I'm a good communicator, but really what's more, it's more like, no, you can't like, no, you just can't stop me. <laughs> yeah, you, you do not give up on things. Yeah. <laughs> the, so flip that coin. What do you struggle with on a day-to-day basis? Time management, you know, like that thing, that separation of, of, there is, like you said, there literally is no separate, and that sounds kind of crazy. No matter how much I love my work, there should be a separation between my work, and I can't find it. There's no, like, so that, that's probably, I don't mind, it's good, like, I like what I do, but probably if somebody was to look at that, that's not so good, and there should be, like, some kind of separation but i don't know that's the thing it's why i love my work so much if i'm awake i'm like i'm not like ever not liking it you know like it's everything oh we're gonna go travel we're gonna do my whole family is a family business you know so it's like we build it together it's not like it's it's just it's all part of our like our you know our legacy (laughs) the one of the questions that i ask a lot of guests and in some of the things i ask them for a problem they're trying to solve and I've seen in the writing about you, Tracy, two of the things that are very important to you are the abolition of the prison industrial complex and the Canadian coalition against the death penalty. As we start to wrap up, are are those two areas that you can dive into a little more for our listeners so they can understand why you're so invested in them? So the prison industrial complex, that was just education, you know, the when I got involved with the death penalty work, you know, we'd previously been, like I said, anti-racist work and, you know, social justice issues and anti-poverty and all that. And the death penalty, which we had never thought about, we don't even have it in Canada, but, you know, it's, but we, but anymore, but um, it seemed like a microcosm of all of that stuff. Only now they're killing people. So you got the racism issues and you got the poverty issues and you got all that stuff, but it all combines in something no one's looking at. It's a dark area that no one pays attention to. We've been told this or that, you know, and, you know, so that was a huge eye opener. And then when you learn more about that, you learn that the death penalty is actually in, you know, people can research this, but it's directly related to lead to lynching in America. And the, the reasons that we still maintain the death penalty and a lot of that. So there's a whole bunch of deep, really dark stuff with, with the death penalty aspect. And then learning so much about the death penalty, I uh, learned about the American prison system and, you know, private prisons, which now, you know, we're getting some change on that. But like, just like it's, you know, and then the issues, it's not just America. We've got issues here in Canada, you know, a lot of, it's Aboriginal more than a black issue when it comes to racism and in, in, in prison system. But I mean, we don't pay attention to our prison system because we've been told that's just where the bad people are, you know. But the fact of reality is, it's a you know revolving door, and the way society works, you know, you're the bad people could be, you know, your brother, your whatever. It could be you tomorrow with America, the wrongful convictions, and also, and and it goes deeper than that too. The the simple fact that you know in the 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 um 1996 effective death penalty act, the one that Biden was instrumental in writing and now that he's pretty sad about sorry about it devastated communities because and also you know the whole when they um the whole drug uh drug charges that you know basically it was okay if you were white and doing coke you were fine but if you were black and doing crack in the ghetto they literally came in and they they destroyed whole communities took fathers uncles brothers literally masses of people away so what we have 20 years after that or 10 years after that is just you know whole societies of people that grew up missing there was no father there was no uncle there was no, they they saw their communities destroyed they had a lack of hope lack of you know whatever they saw wrongful convictions it's a, so there's it's just so deep and so dark in terms of the prison industrial complex and it's a whole an area that we don't think about because we all think it's not us i've never been in prison i've never 
been arrested. I've never, you know what I mean? So for those of us who, it's not a part, those of us who can change it, we're not even looking at it. And it's literally horrifying and terrifying. There's some, you know, and it has societal implications beyond what happens. You know, even if you don't care about what happens under your name in four walls, you know, which you should, it has deep societal implications. And people get out after being treated that way. And those are damaged people. Obviously, they come out and, you know, de- hurt other people and continue the cycle. So we have to find a better way. And there's a there's a very good documentary for people who haven't dove too much into this on Netflix that you can see called 13th. Ugh. That's pretty eye opening. So we'll we'll share that in the show notes as a as a show. I think Tracy nice. yeah. that people could really benefit from, and I, I think it speaks to a lot of what you were just highlighting. So as we finish off, how can my listeners find you? So first, I want to remind them to go and down to go check out Jimmy Dennis because that's really most important. All streaming platforms. The Tears This Year is the great song. <laughs> and it really is. You'll be blown away. Um, but otherwise, as you want to find me, and I'm again, I work with anybody in the English-speaking world because that's my only language. But if you speak, you work anywhere where the media is English, I can get you in media there. And I'm happy to speak to anybody that's interesting. So you can find me at Tracy Lamore. Oh, no, wait, what is it? LamoriMedia.com, or you can find me on Instagram at Tracy Lamori PR Media, or on Facebook at Tracy Lamori, or on LinkedIn. That's a good one, too. Excellent, Tracy. So we'll link all of that in the show notes. And the song that people should be looking for is Tears This Year by Jimmy Dennis. So we'll have, we'll have that link for people as well to the Spotify file would be great. Thank you very much. I appreciate having this conversation with you Thank today. Thank you so much. Me too. Great questions. All right. Talk soon. Bye, Tracy. Thank you for joining us on The Pursuit of Learning. Make sure to hit the subscribe button and head over to our website, thepursuitoflearning.com, where you will find our show notes, transcripts, and more. If you like what you see, sign up for our mailing list. Until next time, your host in learning, Clint Murphy.